story of Playboy's most tragic playmate. Dorothy Stratton was poised to be the next Marilyn Monroe until she was brutally murdered. She was a beautiful young model and a Hollywood star on the rise, but then she was brutally murdered. Playboy's 1980 Playmate of the Year, Dorothy Stratton, had just finished production on her first major film, They All Laughed, starring Audrey Hepburn, when her estranged husband, Paul Snyder, killed her with a 12-gauge shotgun and then shot himself in their West Los Angeles apartment on August 14th, 1980. The 20-year-old body was found raped and beaten, her face blasted by Snyder's gun. The blonde beauty was ambition, was gone. Her story left America wondering if Playboy, Playboy was to blame. Stratton signing a copy of Playboy's magazine during a reception at the mansion in May 1980. Stratton met Snyder, a small-time promoter and pimp, when she was a teenager and working at a Vancouver, B.C. Dairy Queen in 1977. Her sweet face and mature body were captivating, and Snyder quickly realized he'd stumbled upon someone with big-time star potential. He convinced her to pose for a nude photo shoot that he'd sent to Playboy. Shortly after that, editors selected her Playmate of the Month for August 1979. Snyder controlled her finances and real estate and even determined who she'd need to sleep with to further her career. As Stratton shot to stardom, Snyder grew obsessive. According to the Pulitzer Prize winning Village Voice, piece of death of a playmate, Penned by Teresa Carpenter in 1980, Snyder controlled her finances and real estate and even determined who she'd need to sleep with to further her career. The late Hugh Hefner, who passed away at the age of 91 on Wednesday, was, of course, on the list. But there was a friendship between us. It wasn't romantic, Hefner, who thought of himself as her father, Figner told Carpenter. This was not a very loose lady. Stratton and Snyder married in Las Vegas on June 1, 1979, and six months later, the model, who had migrated into Hefner's inner circle, was presented with a golden opportunity, the chance to star in a movie directed by Peter Bogdanovich called They All Laughed, featuring Audrey Hepburn and Ben Gazzara. It was the model's big break. Stratton and Bogdanovich, a close friend of Hefner at the time, started up an affair Shortly after filming began, Bogdanovich was very excited about her and the film, Hefner told Carpenter in 1980. I don't think that he was playing with this at all. I think it was important to him. I'm talking about the relationship. Stratton subsequently ended her her relationship with Snyder in June 1980 via a letter claiming they were separated physically and financially when they met a little over a month later to discuss the divorce. He shot her in the face.
Her blonde hair hung naturally, oddly unaffected by the violence to her countenance. Carpenter writes of Stratton's body at the murder scene. The shell had entered above her left eye, leaving the bones of that seraphic face shattered and displaced in a water of pulp. Her body mocking the soft, languid poses of her pictorials was in full rigor. This content is important for you may be able to find the same content in another format just as we're presenting next. This is a different perspective, more in depth. Uh, why are we doing the case for uh, Dorothy Stratton? I think there's a lesson in it. Um, and I also feel that some of the younger generation um, have no idea about this case um, and the history behind Playboy. So I hope you all enjoy. Here we go. Of all the deceased celebrities who have developed a cult following in the years following their death, Dorothy Stratton is easily one of the most fascinating. A gorgeous bombshell blonde who gained notoriety in the late 70s and early 80s as a model for Playboy magazine. At 20 years old, she seemed to have her whole life ahead of her, and was someone many believed could ascend to stardom far beyond the pages of Hugh Hefner's magazine. Ultimately though, her life would be cut tragically short, and her star snuffed out before it had even begun to shine, leaving behind a legion of heartbroken fans and loved ones asking why, and pondering what the future might have been. Dorothy Ruth Hoogstraten was born to Simon and Nellie Hoogstraten at Grace Maternity Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia. Her parents were immigrants from the Netherlands, as indicated by their last name that I probably butchered terribly. She grew up in a rougher area of Vancouver, but stayed out of trouble and was a successful student in school. She never considered herself the kind of girl who'd become any kind of celebrity, least of all a model. She always viewed herself as pretty plain looking and felt more like the average girl next door as opposed to a starlet in waiting. About halfway through high school though, she began to notice she was getting more attention than usual from her male classmates. And unfortunately, this attention extended beyond boys her age and to men much older than she was. One day while working a shift at a local Dairy Queen, she met a 26 year old man by the name of Paul Snyder who looks exactly like the kind of guy that would go into a Dairy Queen and hit on a high school girl working there. In addition to being 10 years older than Dorothy, Paul was also a nightclub promoter and alleged pimp. So basically the poster child for the kind of person you wouldn't want anywhere near your teenage daughter. Dorothy, however, found herself enjoying the attention she was receiving from the much older Paul and a few weeks after meeting, the two began dating in a relationship that was a textbook example of grooming. Snyder would buy Dorothy lavish gifts and take her to expensive dinners, and even bought her an extravagant gown to wear to her senior prom, which he attended with her because it was the 1970s and a 20-something year old alleged pimp showing up to a high school prom didn't set off alarms with anyone for some reason. Now, it's worth noting that not everyone approved of Dorothy and Paul's relationship, but the people who had the power to stop it, namely Dorothy's parents, didn't actually seem all that bothered by it. Unfortunately, these sorts of predatory relationships were much more socially accepted back then. From early on in their relationship, 
Paul had attempted to convince Dorothy to pose nude for photographs, believing that she had a good shot at becoming a model for adult magazines, specifically Playboy. The Hugh Hefner owned publication was coming up on its 25th anniversary, and there was a contest going on called The Great Playmate Hunt, which Paul believed his girlfriend had a good shot at winning. Dorothy was hesitant at first, but eventually came around to the idea. At this point though, she was only 18, which was a year younger than 19, the legal age of adulthood in British Columbia. So she had to get her mother to sign off on consent forms for the photographs to be taken. Paul hired a professional photographer and paid for the photos, then afterwards asked for copies of them to be sent to Playboy's offices, where they came across the desk of talent scout Marilyn Grabowski. Grabowski was immediately struck by Dorothy's innocent looks, describing her as a quote babe in the woods and invited her to fly down to Playboy's headquarters in Los Angeles, California. Stratton, accompanied by Snyder, made the trip where Dorothy posed for some test shots and was told by Grabowski that Playboy would be in contact if she made the cut. In August 1978, she was informed she had made it into the top 25 and decided to move to Los Angeles where she could begin pursuing her modeling career more heavily. It was here she shortened her last name from Hoogstratton to simply Stratton, as Playboy's editors felt a less cumbersome surname would help her become more recognizable. She was also given a job at the Playboy Mansion, and to say the sudden shift of environment was a shock to her system would be an understatement. Dorothy admitted to friends that working at the Playboy Mansion was extremely intimidating, as she was constantly propositioned by the very affluent men who'd attend parties there. The coercive environment she now found herself in was a far cry from the after-school job at an ice cream parlor she had worked just a few short years earlier. Soon after she began working at the Playboy Mansion, Paul flew down from Canada to be with her. He also proposed to her not long after arriving, and the two were engaged to be married. Snyder was no doubt a source of comfort for Dorothy in this new life she found herself thrust into. But Paul's motivations were much more nefarious than his young fiancé initially realized. He showed a growing obsession with Dorothy's success, largely because success for her also meant success for him. He desperately wanted to be like Hugh Hefner, and tried as hard as he could to leverage Dorothy's connections with him Playboy to further his own financial goals. Snyder became her de facto agent, and upon finding out she wanted to expand her career into the film industry, her acting coach, which, given his lack of experience in either department, makes about as much sense as a university hiring Jake Paul to teach genetic engineering. But it's understandable that in a world where everyone was looking to use Dorothy for something, she would gravitate toward the one person whom she trusted the most. Sadly, she would soon find out this trust was gravely misplaced. The following year, the contest wrapped up and Dorothy had come in second place, barely losing out to model Candy Loving. According to some, this decision was made because Playboy felt that the older Loving would handle the spotlight better than the younger Stratton. The magazine still felt strongly about her future and set up for her to be featured in the August issue of Playboy later that year. In June of 1979, Paul and Dorothy married in a small ceremony. With his finances now firmly tied to hers, Snyder became even more controlling of his wife, dictating things like her diet, how much alcohol she could consume, and even encouraging her to sleep with certain prominent figures that came through the Playboy Mansion, such as actors, film producers, and even Hefner himself in an attempt to further her career. Dorothy, by all accounts, was disgusted by this suggestion, and it caused her to look at their relationship in a negative light for the first time. Paul often bragged to friends of Stratton's accomplishments, and referred to her as the next Marilyn Monroe. But this praise came off less like a husband rejoicing in his wife's success and more like someone who thought they had just purchased a winning lottery ticket. The rapidly maturing Dorothy took note of this, 
resulting in things becoming rocky in the couple's life not long after they had said I do. As Playboy was working on getting the August 1979 issue together, Hefner and the other magazine staff were so happy with Dorothy's pictures that they decided to make her the year's Miss August. During 1979, she also landed her first on-screen roles. She understood that photo shoots for Playboy wasn't something she could rely on forever, and believed her prospects for long-term success lay within the film industry. It would undoubtedly be a tough transition for her to make. The life of a Playboy centerfold was very much a double-edged sword, as a multitude of women over the years had tried and failed to take the next step in their career. But many, including Hefner himself, believed Dorothy could be the exception to the rule, as numerous people who'd got to know her felt she possessed legitimate acting talent. Her first slate of roles was mostly small work as a background extra, with her only starring role being in the very strange Canadian exploitation film Autumn Born. But with Hollywood, the most important thing a lot of the times is simply getting your foot in the door. By the end of the year, there was a clear tension beginning to develop within Dorothy and Paul's marriage, as she was quickly becoming tired of Snyder's constant presence and was starting to realize that she didn't really want or need him around anymore. When January of 1980 came around, Dorothy was trying to dislodge her husband's firm grip on her life and career. She was spending more and more time away from him, even beginning to frequent the Playboy Mansion without his company, and had made the decision to replace him as her manager with someone who actually knew what they were doing. Paul was enraged by this, and insisted that he have full control over negotiating her acting roles, arranging her photo shoots, and basically every aspect of her career an ultimatum that Dorothy rightfully pointed out was, well, ridiculous. Eventually, Snyder relented when his wife agreed to borrow $200,000 from Playboy to purchase a home for the two in West Los Angeles. Unbeknownst to him, though, at the advice of her new manager, Dorothy began funneling her earnings into a business entity called Dorothy Stratton Enterprises, under which her husband was not listed as an officer meaning she was now accumulating a pool of wealth that Snyder couldn't legally touch his scent of. It was around this time that she met director Peter Bogdanovich during a party at the Playboy Mansion. Bogdanovich was best known for his 1971 Academy Award-winning film The Last Picture Show, but had recently seen his career enter a slump, ending the decade with a string of films that were both critically panned and box office failures. Additionally, he had garnered a reputation for being extremely arrogant and a nightmare for producers to work with. To top it all off, his recent eight-year romance with actress Sybil Shepard provided endless amounts of sensationalist fodder for tabloids. However, he was still regarded as a talented, if problematic, filmmaker, and was currently working on a screenplay for a romantic comedy entitled They All Laughed, which he hoped would restore his box office credibility. Dorothy and Peter hit it off almost immediately, and Bogdanovich decided to cast her in his upcoming film, with the two entering into a very secretive romantic affair soon after. It was Miss Stratton's first shot at a starring role in a big budget film, with a serious, albeit slightly damaged, director, and it would also prove a profound example of art imitating life. The 40-year-old filmmaker fell head over heels for the 20-year-old playmate and began incorporating many of the details from their newly sprung romance into the film's script, and even making John Ritter's character, who was Dorothy's love interest in the film, look more and more like himself. Stratton would spend the early months of 1980 finishing up filming for the science fiction comedy Galaxina, a silly B-movie that was intended as a spoof of films like Star Wars and Alien. It was released in June of that year to not-so-great reviews and was a flop at the box office, 
Throughout this time, her marriage continued to disintegrate, but prospects were looking bright in her professional career. She was very excited about her upcoming role and they all laughed. And in the early months of 1980, she found out that Playboy was going to name her the 1980 Playmate of the Year. Snyder took notice of his wife's attempts to distance herself from him and tried desperately to maintain his hold over her. When Dorothy left for New York at the beginning of spring to start filming on They All Laughed, Paul insisted that he tag along. However, Stratton told him that Bogdanovich had closed off the set to anyone not involved with the production. This, of course, was a lie, as Dorothy wanted the freedom to continue her relationship with Peter and was concerned that her husband hovering around the set could potentially ruin the biggest opportunity of her career. Filming began in March of 1980, and during her time in New York, Dorothy lived with Bagdanovich, continuing their affair in secrecy. The director described this period as the happiest time of his life, saying that Miss Stratton was his soulmate and the two were profoundly in love. As we'll discuss later, the truth behind this sentiment is somewhat murky, but without a doubt, Peter was an improvement upon the admittedly low bar set by Paul Snyder. Whether it was a simple fling born of lust or the storybook happily ever after that Bogdanovich claimed, Dorothy certainly seemed much happier in her new relationship than she was in her marriage. Paul would often call his wife to speak with her but found her responses cold and distant, with Dorothy eventually instructing Bogdanovich's assistants to screen the calls and not to answer anything coming from her husband. Miss Stratton briefly returned to Los Angeles in April to attend a ceremony officially announcing her as the 1980 Playmate of the Year, for which she received over $200,000 in cash and prizes, including a brand new Jaguar. This would be the final time she would willingly stay at the West LA home she shared with her husband. She appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson later that same night and was soon back out on the road for a multi-week publicity tour in Canada, which Dorothy and her manager requested Paul not accompany her on. Snyder was becoming very distraught at his wife's sudden independence and confessed to friends he was worried their marriage was falling apart. These fears boiled over after reading a letter Stratton had sent him from Canada, where she suggested that the two should consider spending some time apart. Paul became livid and called his wife saying he was going to hop on the next plane and meet her in Vancouver, whether she wanted him to or not. Upon hearing this, Dorothy's manager offered to hire her a bodyguard, however she declined. Snyder arrived during the last week of her Canadian tour during which she had planned to spend time with her family. Paul, however, insisted that she use the time to make appearances around various nightclubs, which he arranged with the owners, having known many of them from his time as a promoter. Dorothy reluctantly agreed, and Paul booked the appearances, then proceeded to pocket all of the earnings for himself, in a move that was undoubtedly an attempt to reaffirm control over his wife. Stratton, however, simply ended the tour prematurely and flew back to New York to continue filming, where her husband could not follow. It was after this that Paul finally realized his empire was built on nothing. He couldn't garner even a fraction of the love and adoration that his wife did. She was the star and he was simply a two-bit hustler that everyone tolerated because of her. Now she was slipping out of his reach and slowly surrounding herself with an army of business managers and lawyers who would be all too happy to eject Mr. Snyder from her life. He returned to LA a defeated and broken man, with rumors now circulating that his wife was having an affair with Bogdanovich. He spent the next couple months sulking in his home, renting out rooms to the few friends he had for money and to not be alone. He also began his own affair with a 17-year-old amateur model, attempting to groom her in a similar manner that he had with Dorothy, only to callously cast her aside once he realized she would never be able to offer him the same level of success his wife had. In June, Dorothy sent Paul a letter confessing her affair with Bogdanovich, 
and informing him that their marriage was over and that upon her return to LA, she wanted to meet and begin discussing a financial settlement. Snyder's depression turned into rage. In retaliation, he emptied out, then closed the couple's joint bank account and sold off all her possessions at a loss, including her new Jaguar and the plaque she had received from Playboy when she won Playmate of the Year. He also hired a private investigator to begin following her and Bagdanovich around in New York, the cost of which quickly drained the funds he had stolen from Dorothy. By this point, he was no longer permitted to speak with her. Any attempts he made to contact her was intercepted by Stratton's manager, and a small weekly payout also given to him through Dorothy's manager was the only bit of money he could now get from her. He confessed to friends that he briefly considered returning to Canada and accepting it was over, but his ego simply would not allow that. In his mind, he had created Dorothy Stratton. She owed everything to him and she belonged to him, and he wasn't going to allow her to just walk away. Dorothy returned to LA at the end of July and quietly moved in with Bogdanovich. Her lawyers and manager offered to deal with Paul themselves, remarking that she would never need to see or speak with him again if she didn't want to. Tragically, she did not accept this offer. Even after everything she had gone through, she still cared for Snyder's well-being and wanted things to end peacefully between them so they could maintain a friendship. Like the babe in the woods that Marilyn Grabowski had seen in those pictures two years earlier, Dorothy was naive to the monster that lay within the man she'd married. At the beginning of August, Dorothy met with Snyder for the first time in months. Paul came into the meeting confident he could win back his estranged wife, but to his dismay, he was no longer talking to the young high school girl he'd met at the ice cream parlor just a few years earlier. Dorothy had grown into a confident and now assertive young woman, who compassionately but adamantly stated that their marriage was over and that her intention was to finalize their separation. Snyder finally admitted defeat and agreed to meet with Dorothy the next week to discuss the terms of their divorce. Stratton walked away from that meeting feeling as though it had gone well and that she would finally be able to begin the next chapter of her life. Paul Snyder, however, walked away formulating a horrific plan. They say hindsight is 2020, but it's hard to not look at the numerous red flags that Paul Snyder showed in the week leading up to the murder of Dorothy Stratton and wonder how so many of them were ignored. Only hours after talking with his soon-to-be ex-wife, Snyder began inquiring around to his friends about buying a gun, something he would talk about frequently over the coming days. He initially borrowed a handgun from an acquaintance, However, soon after, the person requested he bring it back. He then called the private investigator he'd hired to follow Dorothy in New York and asked him to meet at a local gun shop. As someone who was not a legal resident of the United States, Paul couldn't walk into the store and buy a gun himself, so he asked the detective to do it for him, claiming that he needed the firearm for home defense. His request was refused. The next day, Snyder contacted him again and asked if he could purchase a machine gun, again supposedly for home defense, but once again the detective declined. At home with his roommates, Snyder began making disturbing remarks about previous playmates who had died, explaining how Playboy would try to pull any issue they were featured in from stands if they had the time. The night before he was supposed to have his final meeting with Dorothy, Snyder purchased a used 12-gauge shotgun from an Adna newspaper. When his roommates asked what he'd bought the weapon for, he cryptically replied that he was going to take up hunting. On the morning of August 14, 1980, Dorothy got up with a full slate of plans for the day. She assumed the meeting with Paul would take a couple of hours at most and had scheduled a photo shoot for later that afternoon. 
Her agent called and one final time offered to take care of the meeting with Snyder. In what would prove to be the most fateful decision of her short life, Stratton refused, saying it would be easier to just deal with the situation herself. Paul Snyder woke up and made a quick phone call to the private investigator. His roommates would be leaving for most of the day to offer him and Dorothy some privacy while they agreed on the final terms of their divorce. The detective wanted to wire Paul with a microphone. According to Snyder in the talk he'd had with Dorothy the prior week, she had promised to quote always take care of him, and the investigator felt that if they could get her saying this on tape, it would prove useful during any subsequent court battles. However, he lacked the equipment to properly do this and the idea was scrapped. He told Paul he would contact him later that afternoon and hung up the phone. Dorothy arrived at her home with a set of terms written down that she'd meticulously planned out with her lawyer and a small amount of cash. She went inside and began speaking with her estranged husband, when soon after a phone call came from her manager. Stratton answered the phone and briefly spoke with him, giving a cryptic signal they'd discussed previously to indicate everything was fine before she hung up. It was the last time anyone besides Paul would ever speak to her. What happened next isn't entirely known even to this day. Perhaps the settlement wasn't as much as Paul wanted it to be. Perhaps his narcissism just wouldn't allow him to admit their marriage was over. What is known is at some point, things went very, very wrong. Snyder pulled out the shotgun he had purchased the day before and pointed it at Dorothy, ordering her into the bedroom. Here, he made her take her clothes off and strapped her down to a makeshift bondage device he had made out of a weightlifting bench. He then proceeded to sexually assault her repeatedly before holding the barrel of the gun up to her face and pulling the trigger. She died instantly at just 20 years old. One hour later, Paul sat down on the floor next to his dead wife and turned the gun on himself. Later that afternoon, Snyder's roommates returned home. They saw Dorothy's purse lying open on the living room table and assumed the two had made up, so they elected to give them their privacy and proceeded to watch television for the next several hours. Stratton's agent and the private investigator repeatedly called the house in an attempt to reach either her or Paul. Eventually, the roommate answered one of the detective's calls just after 11 p.m explaining that the two were up in the bedroom together and they wanted to leave them alone. His gut telling him something was wrong, the detective pleaded with Paul's roommates to go and check on them. When they walked upstairs and opened the door, they discovered the horrific scene. As police converged on the home, the private investigator contacted the Playboy Mansion where Hefner was informed of the murder. He proceeded to call Bogdanovich who reportedly collapsed on the floor in grief when he heard the news. Dorothy Stratton was gone. Her young life snuffed out just when it was starting to finally begin. A brutal and senseless tragedy that those who knew and loved her would struggle to come to terms with for years. In the immediate aftermath of Stratton's murder, police struggled to piece together what exactly had taken place. Even the medical examiner was initially unable to determine whether Paul had fired the gun or not, due to the sheer amount of blood on his hands making gunshot residue tests inconclusive. As a result, he was forced to categorize Snyder's cause of death as, quote, questionable suicide, possible homicide. The crime scene itself seemed to offer what one would imagine was a pretty open and shut story. Yet many of Dorothy and Paul's friends argued foul play, alleging that the scene had been staged. The private investigator, who had been Snyder's staunchest ally, even spent months lobbying the Los Angeles Police Department to expand the scope of their investigation, arguing Stratton and Snyder had been murdered by some unknown assailants. 
One local psychic even claimed to have ascertained the identity of the killer through her supernatural gifts, placing the blame on an unemployed actor who, according to her, roped Dorothy and Paul into a drug deal that had gone horribly wrong. By the time the dust had settled and the LAPD had finished their investigation, though, the truth was undeniable. Stratton's funeral was held five days later, a ceremony that was paid for by Bogdanovich, after which she was laid to rest at Westwood Memorial Park in Los Angeles. Initially, family and friends were united in their common grief for someone who had meant so much to them, but it didn't take long for that grief to become anger. As is often the case in these sorts of tragedies, many were searching for somewhere to place blame. The obvious culprit here, Paul Snyder, was dead, but many felt that others also bore a portion of the responsibility. The most popular target being the man whose magazine Dorothy had spent her final years working for. Hugh Hefner and his publication had long been criticized for its objectification of women, cultivating what many felt was a misogynistic attitude in its overwhelmingly male reader base. In an article titled Death of a Playmate published in New York's Voice Village magazine in November of 1980, author Teresa Carpenter summarized these feelings, saying, The irony that Hefner does not perceive, or at least fails to acknowledge, is that Stratton was destroyed not by random particulars, but a germ breeding within the ethic. One of the tacit tenets of the Playboy philosophy, that women can be possessed, had found a fervent adherent in Paul Snyder. He had bought the dream without qualification, and he thought of himself as perhaps one of Playboy's most honest apostles. Hefner and others within the magazine's hierarchy aggressively pushed back on these accusations. Hefner claimed that he viewed himself as a father figure to Stratton and called Snyder a quote, sick man, who was in no way indicative of the average Playboy reader's attitude. The most scathing criticism of Hefner, though, came from his former friend, Peter Bogdanovich. Post-production on They All Laughed was nearing its completion at the time of Stratton's murder, but was riddled with complications almost immediately. Time Life Films had spent close to $8 million bankrolling the project, with 20th Century Fox serving as the film's distributor. However, shortly after principal photography had been completed, Time Life shut its doors. The film lingered in purgatory for almost a year on the shelves of 20th Century Fox, as the company was not optimistic about its box office prospects. Finally, in August of 1981, a year after Dorothy's murder, the film was given a limited release to test with audiences. Fox described the screenings as not encouraging and felt it was not worth the investment for a wider release. Determined that his only project with Stratton would see a large audience, Bagdanovich formed his own distribution company and bought the rights himself. This unfortunately ended in catastrophe. Critical reception to the movie was lukewarm at best, and by Bogdanovich's agent's own estimates, the film only managed a meager $1 million in ticket sales against the $5 million Peter had paid for the distribution rights. Despite his best efforts, Dorothy Stratton's final role, a film that both the director and the young starlet had once pinned such high hopes for the future of their careers on, was a failure. Bogdanovich sank into a deep depression following They All Laughed's abysmal reception, and would subsequently take a four-year hiatus from the film industry. At the end of 1981, he decided to start working on a manuscript for a novel about his relationship with Stratton and the details surrounding her murder. With two biopics releasing over the three-year period that it took him to write the book, the public was hungry for more details about Dorothy's short life. When the novel, entitled The Killing of the Unicorn, was released in 1984, it proved controversial to say the least. For the first time, Bogdanovich publicly spoke about how deeply in love he had been with the late model and launched several shocking accusations against Playboy, specifically its polarizing founder. 
Peter alleged that when Dorothy first met Hugh Hefner in 1978, the magazine mogul had attempted to force himself on her while the two were sitting in a hot tub at the Playboy Mansion. Bogdanovich further stated that the only reason Stratton had accepted Paul Snyder's marriage proposal was to end Hefner's advances and that she felt degraded by nude modeling, only viewing the industry as a means to an end. Public reception to the book was mostly negative, with many arguing Bogdanovich's feelings for Dorothy came off less like love and more like an unhealthy obsession for a woman whom he'd only known just a short time. Reviewers also felt the portrayal of himself as a loving, sensitive, and kind soul was self-aggrandizing, with many looking upon his newfound feminist attitude with deep skepticism. After all, up until Dorothy's death, Bogdanovich had been as big a supporter of Playboy as anyone. If Stratton had truly confided in her partner about Hefner's behavior and the humiliation she felt working within the industry, why had the director continued to support said industry, especially given how strong he claimed his love for Dorothy was? That isn't to say the book was universally panned, though. Others viewed Bogdanovich's feelings as genuine and felt it had taken the loss of someone he loved for the filmmaker to finally realize the inherent exploitation within Playboy magazine. To this day, reviews of the book are decidedly mixed, with some praising it as an honest and heartfelt memoir from a grieving lover and other readers viewing it as an exercise in narcissism where Bogdanovich turns a brief fling into a storybook romance to shield himself from the fact that he had used Stratton just as much as those he accused. Hefner was enraged by the book and launched some shocking accusations of his own back at the director. He claimed that a few months after Dorothy's death, Bogdanovich had begun a sexual relationship with Stratton's 13-year-old sister, Louise, with the director grooming the underaged girl in a perverse attempt to use her as a replacement for her older sister. Bogdanovich adamantly denied this, and Stratton's family even filed a slander lawsuit against Hefner that was later dismissed. However, in 1988, the 20-year-old Luis married the now 49-year-old Bogdanovich in a shocking turn of events that many felt lent credence to Hugh Hefner's previous accusations. Luis was emphatic that nothing sexual had taken place between the two until after she had turned 18. But understandably, there are many who to this day do not believe that. The two remained married for 13 years and ultimately filed for divorce in 2001. The brief life and tragic death of Dorothy Stratton has remained a topic of discussion in the four decades since her murder. Despite her brief and objectively unremarkable film career, many feel that there was an unlocked well of potential within the young starlet, as is indicated by the Brian Adams song dedicated to her memory, entitled The Best Was Yet To Come. And this question of what if is one aspect that draws so many people to this story. Perhaps Dorothy may have become a rising star in the movie industry, successfully making the transition from model to accomplished actress that so many before her had failed to do. Or perhaps her dreams of a film career would have faded into mediocrity, adding her name to the pool of countless others who had tried and failed in Hollywood. This, however, is something we will never truly know. Others have placed more emphasis on her story as a cautionary tale against the predatory nature of fame and the dangers women in all walks of life often face. Indeed, both violence and sexual misconduct against women from spouses, co-workers, and others is a problem that continues to this very day and goes far beyond just the film industry. Making Dorothy Stratton a woman that was preyed upon as a minor by a much older man who ultimately took her life in a fit of savage violence, tragically personifying this issue as much as anyone. Whatever message you take from this story is yours to decide, but the tragedy of it all is an undeniable fact. 
a young woman with a successful career and what should have been a long life ahead of her, only to have it taken all too soon.